Samuel Dewitt Proctor School of Theology uh, at Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. When we're here at the Samuel Dewitt Proctor Conference, you have been very supportive since the very beginning. Um, tell us why you think the Samuel Dewitt Proctor Conference is significant. Well, I think um, the Proctor Conference was uh, birthed when there was a very real uh, void in focusing the church on prophetic issues. I think there was a season in the life of the church where in some ways we had um, uh, grabbed this idea of prosperity and in some ways believed that the indication of our faith was uh, really participating in the excesses of, uh, of capitalism, particularly as it finds expression <coughs> in the in our country and this was kind of sweeping the country and um, the majority of other other conferences and church gatherings were some ways infected by this and if there uh, if there was any response to it it was more of a murmur uh, and we were in desperate need of a gathering in a context where we were challenged in a focused and uh, consistent fashion to maintain our the, the prophetic edge, the prophetic calling, and the prophetic obligation, particularly as it related uh, to the black uh, pulpit, but as related to a global reality. But the very life of the African American church was rooted in its recognition of and response to patterns of life and existence that violated our communities, our persons, and were contrary to the vision of God and the fulfillment of God's reign. So uh, as this was birthed, it was both timely, providential, and necessary. So as an institution and personally, we immediately begin to assess how we might support it and embrace it, and particularly uh, we shared uh, a name and sought to honor a common vision in ministry and a commitment that that name represented. Uh, one of the critical aspects of education in this uh, context is an issue of conscientization. That is, do you have the courage and the commitment to be honest about what has been done in the name of Christ uh, under the flag of God and what are the very clear incarnational and structural manifestations of using God to support and condone uh, really the abuse of creation uh, in, in its total expression, whether it be uh, the environment, whether it be human beings, uh, and, the, and the marked manifestations of violation and of victimization through objectification that have, that have occurred. And in many cases, the church um, on, on one side has been stolidly silent and on the other side has been a willing and invested participant in the maintenance and, and in supporting what is really destroying the earth and is absolutely alien to the person and practice of Jesus and contradictory to the vision of God for, for our future together. I had the opportunity to hear you last year at Sojourners mm -hmm. and then at Princeton Theological. Mm -hmm. um, both talking at times about hierarchy, this yeah. great chain of being. Talk yeah. a little bit about hierarchy and how you see this sort of imbalance or how it's played out within the church and faith. Community. Well, I, you know, if, as you know, as you say when you hear me speak, I think you, there's no way to get around about what the fundamental distortion has taken us out of relationships built upon mutuality, reciprocity, and the recognition of the inherent intrinsic value in all creatures and all creation to a point 
where we are ranking creation and are hierarchically structuring relationships and our interpretations of the world with a superior and an inferior. And it is destroying the world. It is destroying uh, possibilities and promise in the world. Right now, we have the clear evidence of this country, in this country, that there is a sense among many that there's some people that don't matter. And the naive assumption that somehow anybody who is not making it, uh, they're lazy, ignorant, ill-equipped, or uh, in, in some way deviant or even criminal, rather than recognizing that there is a structural reality based upon the value that we assign pe to people that almost um, structurally mandates that we will always have separation uh, and alienation. And I believe this is a fundamental corruption in our community, and it's in the church. Even to the degree, the way we design our church administration, even how we have, have established lines of demarcation of who has status and value in the church, or even the demarcation between the pulpit and the pew. And we, we live trying to move up the ranks rather than trying to collapse the rank and live functionally to fulfill the design of God. I always help people understand that doesn't mean there will not be functional differentiation. There will be pastors, there will be this. There will be presidents and they will be this. But there is no uh, anti-gradation where some people are viewed as less than. And that's what's going on right now. Some people are viewed then less than. And if we really say that somebody's not less than, then things like a living wage become critical. Because I can't say that we all have value and then I structure the economic system wherein you cannot fully participate and access value and participate in the, in, in the added value that's possible in our world. So um, for me it's fundamental to what the fall means. And it's something that has to be corrected. But I don't see too many of us willing to transcend the hierarchy when we've received privilege and benefit in the hierarchy. So our primary driving motivation is the maintenance of our privilege, which leads to the maintenance of the hierarchy. I would not say I'm, a, a, I'm not a biblical scholar, I teach theology, but when I read scripture, I'm looking through a theological lens. Now, a biblical scholar will say, well, you're imposing theological thoughts or categories that were not a function of that world. So for them, the limit of interpretation is derived from a kind of social historical critical method. But I believe that the, the dynamism of the word, it's trying to communicate some truths. So when I read that and I see, here you have an, a symbol that represents that which is inviting us to participate in thought and behavior uh, in that which is alien to God's design. And he introduces certain categories. He introduces a concept that God is threatened by you and wants to deny you in order to maintain God's superior position. When the way God has revealed God's self is God is with you. And God is giving God's self to empower you. So it's the snake that pushes God up there and makes you down here. And then he lies about your, the gift of your creation and suggests that you can get up from the down position by doing certain things. And so he's setting up a competitive hierarchy. And then the consequences of the snake lead to certain things. We end up preaching and teaching what the snake is saying as God's truth. And we also end up teaching the consequences and the behavior that is derived from listening to a snake as normative for God's design. 
And that's when I say snakeology. So we're saying God, but our logos is the snake. You know, our, our center of discourse and understanding and how we construct and uh, envision the world is not theos, not God's logos, it's the snake's logos. Mm.